I don't blame him. And welcome back. Well, our next guest had a very painful childhood. As a kid, his father was abusive and taught him to commit crimes. Later, his dad tried to kill his mother by cutting the brakes of her car, then abandoned her with their four children, leaving her homeless. David Crow says it took a lot for him to break free of their influence. He wrote this book. It's called The Pale Faced Lie. In his new memoir, he reveals how he found a way to cope and eventually learned to forgive. Great to meet you. Thanks Great to meet you. Here. Thank you. Why the pale faced lie? Well, I want my reader to read to get to this point. We moved to the Navajo Indian Reservation nine months after my dad got out of San Quentin for a crime that could have gotten him the death penalty. He hid there to hide from an accomplice and you could lie about checking the violent felony box. Um, he grew up in Southern Oklahoma where there were Cherokees and there's many lies in the book, but the, the one that we lived with always was that we were full-blooded Cherokees. Wow. So there's several lies that we uncover, and I want my reader to figure out how I learned my identity as I did, which comes late in the book um, when my Navajo code talker, you know, one of the original code talker, was a mentor, a coach, 4-H chairman. He and I had a talk that was very painful mm -hmm. about who I really am and what we really were all about. And I want my reader to get there with me yeah. and figure out why the title. But I think it will make sense if you see it through. Take that journey with you. I think that's fascinating. You, you grew up in a pretty tough situation. A violent father, like you said, who had gotten out of jail. He had you commit crimes with him. He did. He and I would go to warehouses on the Navajo Indian Reservation. He was a safety officer, so he had keys to everything. And he would steal really expensive tools and fence them in the nearby town of Gallup, New Mexico. And I was his lookout. Mm. And I, he taught me to watch for clues, people who might be coming up on us. During those rides, he'd tell me about murders he'd committed, murders that he knew that people in the San Quentin Penitentiary, when that guy sat around in the yard. Yep. And um, he was always saying, his favorite saying was, murder's the easiest crime. If you do it right, there are no witnesses. Wow. How old were you when this was happening? Uh, it began when I was about eight, where we, I was actually his lookout. And I've learned to get into his head because it would, I thought it would help me. And I got to the point where I completely understood him. So when you get late in the book, where there's a couple of murders where he tries to drag me in, um, every bit of my life knowledge of knowing him taught me how to get out of the, get out of the trouble I'm in. And yeah. I wouldn't be here today if... Uh, if I hadn't figured that out and knew how to stop him. Wow. What, what made him tick? What have you figured out about him? I figured out that people who commit violent crimes and that belong in penitentiaries are built different than you and me. Mm -hmm. Somebody might offend you and you would say, well, you're a jerk and walk away. He'd stay and fight you to the death. Mm -hmm. And I just think, I don't know if it's genetic, you're taught it, but there are some people who think violence is the only answer. Mm -hmm. And unless, I mean, his favorite saying is there were more richly deserving bastards that deserve to die. And I'd always say, well, why couldn't you walk away? Mm -hmm. A real man never walks away. Mm -hmm. And he'd say, well, I don't believe that. I think that any violent confrontation, most normal people, I like to think we all three are, would avoid it at all costs. He would look for it. Yeah. He would seek it out, it sounds. You know, I think what's interesting as a, as a child, you know, when you grow up with, with a parent, um, you, you always idealize them. You, you know, do. You, Your parents are your parents. <clears throat> so whether they're good people or they're not good people, I wonder how you dealt with that love versus loathe or idealization or putting them on a pedestal. And, and if he, if you, what you thought of him as a kid. Yeah, that's a great question. And I had a very mentally ill mom mm -hmm. who by the age of about eight, she wanted me, she wanted to be my child, and there was some of that. Well, the conflict, so many things happened to me that were so difficult that by the time of age 10, I never was able to tell anybody for over 40 years. Very conflicted. Uh, you grow to believe you deserve how you're raised, and you believe that you don't have any more to offer than what you're taught. I think the crux of the book is the journey I took basically to forgive my father and, and to a certain extent my mother and forgive myself and make a decision. I didn't deserve that. I'm not what they tell me I am and I never was violent, but I was very conflicted about 
deserving good things, deserving to be around good people, being worthy. Um, and I probably didn't solve that problem until about 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah. My biggest regret in life is I couldn't have come to that conclusion, confronted them, confronted the memories very directly, forgiven them, forgiven me. If I'd have done that 30 years younger, my life would have been a lot better. So hopefully I have a lot of good life left. Great kids, great wife. Um, but by the time I wrote this book, it was like I wrote about a different person. Yeah. The David Crow standing in that picture is not me. Yeah. And by the time I wrote it, I was outside myself. And the number one thing I tell people, how do I feel? Free. Yeah. Free is, at last. Is your dad, are your parents still living and did you ever confront your dad? I did. <clears throat> and he got really vicious, told me I was a coward. That was no damn good. I'd never be a man. I'm not a good man now. Mm -hmm. And stop making up this, rev this revisionist nonsense. When I put the phone down, I realized it was always going to be my fault. And if I couldn't forgive him for everything and then forgive me, I wouldn't be okay. So I did that. I didn't do it in a hostile way. I just said, do you regret, you know, what you did to my mom, my sisters, me, what you did to us? And he said, not a bit. You had a lot better than I did, and you had it a hell of a lot better than you deserve. And I'm like, whoa. Ask my mom, do you feel like you put too much on me? At 10, you wanted me to be the head of the house, go off with you, live on welfare and my paper out money. And she said, you abandoned me. You have a lot to be accountable for. When I put the phone down, I said, this would always be my fault. I forgive you. I believe you couldn't be a different person or you would. From that moment forward, as I began to write the book, I felt a freedom I've never felt my whole life. And I almost feel like a normal, good person that has as much to offer as anybody else. But it's still a struggle. Yeah. Uh, when you grow up in a situation, it's hard to break cycles. Yeah. You know, um, alcoholics marry alcoholics. Women whose mother are beaten frequently will marry a man that does that to them. I understand that because once you get to a certain age, whether you idealize your parents or not, and they tell you who you are, that's who you are. To break out of that, I found, it's and tough. there's some chapters in there, I found to be the most difficult part of my journey. I think a lot of people are gonna wanna get their hands on your book and, and read it. It's davidcrowauthor.com where you can get a copy of The Pale-Faced Lie, a true story. Thank you so much for sharing with us, David. Thanks for having me, I loved Appreciate it. Appreciate it, nice to meet you. You too.